Rock Chat with Trace. Welcome to Rock Chat with Trace. In this podcast, I am talking to Larry Hibbert, who produced Sea Girls, Open Up Your Head, alongside many other hits. And he's also a member of A Hundred Reason. Hello, Larry, and welcome to Rock Chat with Trace. When did you start playing the guitar? I started playing the guitar when I was about probably 13 or 14 years old. And I got a, bought an electric guitar by a manufacturer called Aria Pro. I don't even know if you can still get them. They were cheap guitars. And just taught myself to play on that. Having previously taught myself to play on my dad's nylon string acoustic, like classical guitar that he'd had since he was at university. But my first lecture was an Aria. And yeah, I just sort of taught myself to play in drop D um, and started playing rips. I was actually a drummer first. I've been playing drums for a couple of years by then. Obviously, you can't write songs on the drums. Well, not songs I wanted to write. So uh, I picked up the guitar to enable me to do that. How did the band A Hundred Reasons form? Good question. I was actually the new boy in A Hundred Reasons. And when I joined, it became A Hundred Reasons. But they were... They'd all previously been in a band called Floor, um, who were a bit more metal than 100 Reasons were. And they had got, well, they kicked out their bass player, and then the Andy, the bass player 100 Reasons, moved to bass, and I joined on guitar, and that's when we changed the name to 100 Reasons, and started becoming a little bit less metal, and ended up where we were. So that was it. And um, that, we kind of met around, like, they were all from sort of Camberley and Surrey, and I lived, I've always lived in South West London, and we met playing in and around Kingston, really, around the Peel pub and all that sort of stuff. I went to area. And what is now Banquet Records, um, we used to all hang out there when it, but then it was Davis Banquet um, before John Toy bought it. So yeah, just we knew each other from a sort of South West London, Surrey rock scene. What was the worst thing that happened to you on stage? We were. The second time, I think it was, that we played Reading Main Stage, about halfway up the bill, decent slot for us, probably the probably the, the highest we were ever billed on any festival ever. Might have been the first time, I can't remember. And we were playing, I think we were, I can't remember what song we were playing, and someone threw an egg at us, you know, which is pretty standard festival behaviour, so nothing that unremarkable about it. Not that people throw stuff at us all the time, but, you know, you play at festivals, people throw stuff. Uh, and So it would have gone completely unnoticed otherwise, but weirdly, it, it managed to hit perfectly. It was a brilliant shot, whoever threw it. I mean, it managed to perfectly hit the power connection going into my pedal board, shorting that, which then tripped all the power for half of the stage. And that was the half of the stage that included all my amps and all of the Andy, the bass player's amps. So suddenly, you know, three-fifths of the sound we could make disappear. And actually, because the bass went, there's a lot more of that sound, you know, it's probably about half of it. <laughs> uh, and it took about five or six minutes to get it turned back on because the stage electrician was having his lunch at the time. So someone had to be scrambled to the catering tent to find this guy. And yeah, five or six minutes when you're stood on stage at Reading with all those people watching you feels like about a week. So that was pretty bad. Although Colin actually did really well. It was one of his best ever frontman moments where he, he managed, he started, to, well, he, first he sung like some Nestle theme song without any accompaniment because Mike Patton used to do it. And so he thought that was cool, entertain people for a little bit. And then he started getting the crowd to build human pyramids. Um, and we were seeing how high we could get human pyramids, which, you know, filled the rest of the space until we could get back to going. And actually, in the end, it wasn't that bad. We just had to drop one song. Um, but yeah, that was that was pretty embarrassing. What's your favourite 100 Reasons album? I don't know. Probably the first one, because... I, well, the first one, because it, it just changed a lot of things for us. and changed a lot of things for me. And I would be doing what I'm doing now had it not been for that record. So regardless of... I don't listen to any of them, to be honest, so I don't have a favourite one for listening to, so I don't listen to any of them. But uh, as far as memories go due to the recording process and how much of a difference it makes in my life, it's definitely the first album. Can you give an update to the status of 100 Reasons? Permanent hiatus. How did you move from just playing in the band to producing the final two albums? Because we couldn't afford to pay anyone else to do it is probably the simple answer. By that point, we didn't have the support we had in the first two. Uh, and I'd done a 
little bit of producing there. Probably not enough producing to have taken on those projects, but you know, you do these things anyway. So yeah, it was just kind of, it wasn't really another option, to be honest. But I do kind of wish there was, because producing your own band is hugely stressful. I wouldn't recommend anybody do it, um, especially a band that operates as, as a democracy and trying to suddenly step out of that dynamic and be the person who is the bearer of bad news which a producer often is, is difficult. So, yeah, it was just kind of by default, really, more than it being the most ideal thing to happen. Is it good for a band to produce their own album, or do you need an outside voice? Well, it, it depends, right? Because, like, I don't think, you know, lots of people have self-produced their albums, and it's worked fantastically, but I think the more you can evolve outside ears and outside perspective from people you trust and the people that you're happy to work with, better, really. And I think that I think that a lot of people that are in very good bands and are very talented and are very good at what they do realise that and do look to collaborate with other people. Because music's really all about collaboration. I don't think there's much that I don't, I don't you know, I think most music that's good that is made is made out of collaboration and not made out of one person sat on their own doing everything themselves and making all the decisions. That's certainly how I prefer to work. So I would never recommend that that happens, but I'm sure it does work for some people, if that's any kind of answer. Because in this, there are already any ready rules. But no, for bands, I would say, find a producer. Find, try and find the right producer, obviously, because being with the wrong producer for you is worse than doing it yourself. So yeah, just try and find the right producer and then work with people that get the best out of you. How did the opportunity present itself to produce other bands? Well, I'd actually, I'd actually produced other bands before I'd even been in a band, really. The first thing I ever produced, I think I was probably about 14, and me and all my mates used to go to a youth club in Twickenham called Heathen House, and I produced a band called The Walking Abortions. We were a punk band, as you might imagine, from that name, and I produced their first 7-inch, which actually came out on Damaged Goods Records. It was actually a proper release. It came out on 7-inch, and they paid me a pack of bags. Um, so that was my first production. And, and it was amazing actually just be, having a youth club when we were that age, having this youth club that someone, like there was a, there was a youth worker there called Lewis who'd, who'd obviously come across a bit of money from the council at some point and had used that money to kit out a couple of the rooms upstairs with some basic studio equipment. You know, it was nothing to write home about, but it was a little eight-track tape machine, a little desk and a couple of bits of outboard and a handful of mics. And, and it was amazing because we could just go there and record each other's bands and play about with it and, and experiment, kind of left our own devices. And since then, I definitely had a bug for it. So whilst 100 Reasons was going on, initially I was producing 100 Reasons B-sides and then the records, and then ultimately was just, you know, any bands we came across, like, be it bands that we were supporting or bands that were managed by the same people we managed by, or, or whatever, I'd always try and get in the studio with them um, and record them just because it was something I really wanted to do. So, yeah, it's always something that I've had my own doing. And to be honest, like, since we made the first 100 Reasons, I reckon the second one when we were working with Dave Sardi was the first time I'd seen, like, a, like an actual producer work, right, as opposed to, like, you know, things on a sort of lower budget. Um, I really had the bug from that, and that's when I really decided I was... From that moment, I think I always actually wanted to do it more than be in a band. So it's always been the priority for me, kind of since then. So yeah, and I definitely get more from it than I get from going on to it, if that makes sense. I, I'm definitely more naturally drawn to producing than to trying to be a rock star. You recently produced the Seagulls, Open Up Your Head. How did you approach this album? Oh God, um, I mean this has been a long process with Seagulls. I've been working with them for about three years now. I knew their manager, know their manager, but knew their manager John from a long time ago. He was an A&R guy at Virgin. He, approached me with this band he just picked up um, and I basically just started recording them in my place here very early on so everything sort of lost onwards three years ago and all those singles I, I did as well so it's been a gradual process really I don't, I don't feel there was a time where the album started and those singles stopped because some of those songs that we did earlier on are on the album like um, All I Want to Hear You Say is on there and Call Me Out which was even from before I was involved with bands in there so songs that have been about are on there so at some point we, they signed a record deal then suddenly we were in nice studios and then suddenly we were making the album but it really has been a long drawn out process from getting involved with the early singles and being part of developing them as players and as 
as songwriters um, to the point where you're making an um, polydor. And I think that's often the case with bands on their debut records, especially when you get involved early. Like suddenly you find yourself making an album, but it's a kind of just a natural progression from doing those early singles and things. So the question being how did I approach it? Um, well, you know, I approached it to, to make the best album we could possibly make and make them as comfortable as possible and help them go through this transition from being a, you know, a promising local band, not, just, not wanting to use that cliche, to being a band that are suddenly uh, a small fish in a big pond, not the other way around. That's a bit of a step to make. And just try to keep them focused on the music and the songs and what they're good at and what they're best at and try and get the best out of them. And, you know, in a way, shield them from the fact that they've signed this big record deal and trying not to make it a big thing. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how else I really approached it just to make the best record, the most out of Henry the singer, make sure his vocals are great. I mean, you know, they're things that are important. Do you adjust your production style to working with different bands? Yes, definitely. I I don't think it would be good if every, every record I did sounded the same. I think you need to exaggerate the artist and what they're doing more importantly than people like pe- people aren't interested in hearing me make a record particularly they're interested in hearing the artist that's on the record be as good as they can possibly be so i try and inhabit a world with the artist and become part of it and become part of that ride part of that journey and get the best out of them um and the, actually the more i do it and the more experience i have the less i rely on my own little rules or this is the way we do things, this is the way we don't do things. If a band comes in and be like, and they're, they're like, this is my thing, this is our thing, this is what we do, it's really important to us. But if it's something I don't normally do, I don't really care. You know, if that's part of their aesthetic and what makes them unique, then that needs to be explored and that needs to be exaggerated and preserved sometimes. You know, I don't always agree, and there are, and there are times where I might think they're doing something that's a mistake, in which case then we'll have a discussion about it, but I don't know. Um, the more I do it, the more I'm happy to explore things that I might not necessarily be comfortable about. And I think that just comes from a bit of confidence and experience. So, yes, I do adjust my production style aesthetically and sonically, depending on the artist, but I guess that in itself is a production style. So... <laughs> How would you explain to a beginner in music the difference between being a producer to being a mixer? I, you know what, I was trying to explain this to my wife just the other day and I failed. Um, I don't know, as um, the mixer is the finisher, right? You know, I was listening to some, some other producers to give an interview recently and they, they were describing the mixer as being, you know, the finisher in baseball where they bring someone on to close the game. You know what I mean? And, and they, they earn good money and they're well respected because they are a safe pair of hands to finish these projects and bring things to a full stop and do it in a way that adds their flair and their technique and their skill to it and they, they, their consistency to it. The producer, I mean, the, actually the producer's a harder thing to, to answer because sometimes the producer mixes and sometimes I mix and sometimes the producers help written the songs and sometimes they haven't. So the producer exists anywhere in this world between mixing it and writing the song and depending on the project and what's demanded of you you can straddle any part of that or all of it but your job ultimately is to deliver an album and to get the best out of it to produce it to produce the thing and whatever it takes to do that you have to do so yeah that can be technical that can be political that can be songwriting that can be tuning guitars that can be any number of things and yeah the mixer is the finisher the mixer takes the mess that you've made as a producer and hopefully makes it make sense to everybody's ears and to people that aren't necessarily in tune they bring it to life they make it digestible how long does it take on that producer to mix an album i would love to say one week but that's not true i was working on seagulls for pretty much a year but that was not all in one block. I think as well now, like in the early noise, way back then, when 100 Reasons were first making records, we booked to go in with Dave Sardi. We went to New York 
It was costing a fantastic amount of money. We could only afford to be there for two months. So we went there for two months. We spent six weeks in the studio, two weeks mixing it, and you were done. That way of making records doesn't really exist anymore, certainly not for me. So I don't feel there is this way you can say, well, it takes this long to make a record, because very rarely do I now find you book two weeks, three weeks to make a record. The band's there for the whole time. You book the studio for that time. You go and copy your parts down, send it to the mixer at the end, you're done. That doesn't really happen anymore because, you know, because everything's on a computer now and everything's infinitely tweakable, you start working on things and things can sit there for a couple of months and not be touched and then picked up again. You know, so you have, you'll have like a deadline for the product, but that could be a few months away. And you can work and work and work things until that point, but you don't have to get them done in this sort of one place and this one time, and it's not this one event anymore. You know, um, I can be sat here on, you know, a lot of times I have bands in, but there are a lot of days, and I try and leave probably a week out of every month um, where I'm just sat in here organizing and going through all the stuff I've been doing when the bands have been in. And I can sit here in one day and pull up five or six different songs from different artists and pull them up and work on them and work on bits and go through notes that have been sent me. You know, I'm getting notes about monitor mixes and about arrangements or sometimes about actual mixes. You know, I, I go through a mix recall stage with monitor mixes and with bands and with moving stuff around, you know, like it's a mix. And then I send it to a mixer. And those monitor mixes can, can go to revision 10 or revision 11 sometimes, especially if there's an A&R guy, a manager also with an opinion. So, yeah, so in one day I can be working on seven songs simultaneously. And the com it being on a computer now, it one of those allows you to do that. So, yeah, how long a record takes to make is a very difficult question to answer. It's, it's however long it takes people to make all the decisions they have to make to be happy that they have the best thing they can. And that can sometimes take months, even though in those months you might only be working on it for four days. I don't, you know, so... I think they now take longer to land, and they're more difficult to land, more difficult to finish, because technology affords people the ability to explore avenues non-destructively, that makes sense. So people then take advantage of that, and you end up with lots of different versions of lots of different songs. In production, what changes will occur in 2021? Well, in production, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen to music at the moment because of what's going on now. From my point of view, obviously it's decimated live music, but from my point of view, the studios are busy and bands are coming back sooner because they can't go on tour. So in order to have something to keep themselves out in the public eye, they just need more music at the moment. So, you know, in a weird way, it's been good for studios and producers, not just been good for anyone, but it means we're still busy and we're not all sat at home. Um, I don't know what's going to change in 2021. I don't know what impact this is going to have on the sort of bands that I work with, the sort of bands that rely on live business. I can see a situation where they're not going to be getting signed because if they can't go out on tour, then what's the point? They can't sell themselves. So I don't know what impact that's going to have. It's slightly terrifying, the whole thing. There's definitely going to be, I think, probably a six-month lag until the, until this everything that's happening in the music industry starts affecting people like me um, but yeah that's that's something I see that could change I think even more uh, investment will flow towards electronic music and music that's not that doesn't rely on going out on tour because that the pessimist in me doesn't even think that there's going to be much of a festival season next year so you know that's going to start being really terrible for people that make music like I do but I hope I'm wrong how do you approach co-writing a song? I tend to get references from the artist as to what they want to do. Ahead of the session, you'll have conversations with their creative team and their management team about sessions they've done before and what works and what doesn't. I think it's quite useful to have conversations with people that aren't the artists because they may have a slightly more overview of what's happening. Um, and then you also talk to the artist about what they want to do, how they want how they see themselves. I think it's, it's important to, to sort of ask them, you know, when you imagine yourself being on stage and imagine yourself being an artist and doing it, like who who do you look at and go, I want to do that, I want to be like that person, that person makes me feel something. Um, and that can be useful. I think it's just useful to, to have an 
open dialogue about what it is you're doing there and not just come in there and, and sort of present the artist as well. I think we need to do this. It's like, you know, again, no one really wants to hear me on the record. What they do, but they, they want to hear the artist as well. More than that, more than they want to hear me. So, yeah, it's just important to be open and communicative. And then, and then also on the day, I think the, the sessions I've done that haven't gone well is when I've sort of tried to get, tried to push a bit too hard or like tried to get a song down or been watching the clock and being like, oh God, it's 2 p.m. We haven't really done the thing yet. It's like a creative day like that. You're kind of looking for your sort of, there, there'll be a time in the day where suddenly everyone starts working together and you get a lot done in a very short space of time. And getting to that point is quite difficult and can involve just a lot of sitting around talking and hanging out and then just like kind of pretending to play something for a bit but then not really and then at some point hopefully it, you'll come, you'll have two or three hours where kind of everything happens and then you're done for the day it's, it's very different from producing in that you know producing if you're feeling a bit of a lag or you're like okay, I don't know what to do about that you can always just go and do something technical like you know go put some drums in time or you know do a guitar part that you know what you need to do you just need to make sure it's in tune and all the rest of it you, you're not necessarily relying on creative juices the whole time because they run out quicker so you know a studio day you can do 14 15 hours it's just a bit more task based but, but with a writing session i think you you're really good for only three or four hours of intensive work probably over an eight hour day and then you're just kind of cooked you know so it's creating the right environment to get to that point where everybody gels for a bit and everything happens, that's what you're trying to find. What differences or similarities are there between writing your own songs and working with another band? I find working with another band a lot easier because I have less in it for me. That makes sense. All that I have in it for me is different. I'm not going to say I have less in it, but I deeply care about everything I do. But I, it's, I have less... I have less prejudices going into it. I have less like you don't have your babies when when it's not your songs, it's not your stuff. So you're like you don't have these things you desperately want to hang on to at all costs. It's a bit easier just to sit there and be like, and because it's not my thing, it's very easy just to do that. So I find it a lot easier, a lot clearer. And you know, as on my own, I'm not much of a songwriter. You know, I work with other people, and like so, I like to collaborate. I like to get things out of other people. But you know, when I was writing songs in the band, I was writing them with other people. I've never just sat there on my own and written songs. I just, how I work is I feed off other people and I, and I, and I bounce back with other people and I draw on what they're doing. And that's the role I find myself in in the sessions. So that I think lends itself more to producing and co-writing than it does to being an artist. And I ultimately find it more rewarding, less stressful and not easier, but it, it's more natural place for me to be. What was it like working with Dinosaur Pile Up? Matt, great man. Matt's awesome. Matt's someone who has very, very specific ideas about how he wants things. And he pushes and pushes until it's exactly how he hears it in his head, which can get long at times, but ultimately he tends to be right. And he tends to, when you get to a place where you've enabled him to get down onto a track, what it is he's hearing in his head, it tends to sound pretty cool. You know, so he has a very specific aesthetic he needs to hit. He's really obsessed with silence and stops and, and ones of choruses. And, you know, he was making me do stuff that I would never normally do with editing and chopping. Um, but it's, there's stuff from that that I've now taken into my own arsenal and I use all the people because it does sound really cool. Like, I like his way. I like how he sees the track, I like how he envisions his track and how he makes, you know, what are in their bare bones pretty simple three chord rock songs and, but makes them sound superhuman. And it was uh, it was really good, like, it was really awesome to work on that album with him because, you know, you learn stuff from every artist you were with, and I learned quite a lot from him about dynamics and punch and about what's important there and about what's not important. So yeah, how how was it to work with him? It was great. It was tiring at times because he pushes and pushes and pushes, and you know we definitely had a couple of little falling out throughout that. Um, it was kind of intense because of that. So it's just me and him working with each other all the time, really. Um, but ultimately, I'm I'm really really proud of that album. And I'm really proud of the cover they just put out. I think they sound brilliant, and 
you know, Matt has a hell of a lot to do with that. Record Store Days is mum. What's your favourite album at the moment? I don't know if they're albums. I really like the Fever Doobie stuff. I don't know if that's an album though or not. I think that stuff sounds really good. And you know what? This might, this might be a bit of a guilty pleasure. I really like Youngblood. I think he's awesome. They're, neither of those are albums, but those are, that's what those, those two are definitely what I've been listening to over the last week quite a lot. How do people get in contact with you? Uh, through my Instagram. You can go on there and drop me an email. I'm horribly slow at replying to emails, as you know, but I do eventually get around to it. And yeah, it's, I'm always welcome demos or finding out about new bands, and I have an email address on my Instagram page, which is just Larry Hibble. And so you can just hit that. Um, my manager's email is also on there if I don't reply to you. I'd like to thank my guest, producer, Larry Hibbert, for coming on Rock Chat with Trace.